the Hope Diamond has lived through its own veritable odyssey. From the time of its first sale in London at the beginning of the 19th century, all the way to its sudden appearance in Washington, hidden in a brown paper envelope with a $2 postmark. This famous blue diamond is now at home under high security glass in the Smithsonian Institute, and probably second only to the Mona Lisa as the world's most visited object. And yet, this heavenly colored gem still oozes with secrets and mysteries that have yet to be brought to light. You're listening to The Voice of Jewels, a podcast from L'Ecole School of Jewelry Arts, supported by Van Cleef and Arpels, unveiling the stories and secrets behind history's most fascinating jewels. In the great marble-lined hall of the Smithsonian Institute, Sandra is utterly fascinated, standing before the Hope Diamond, truly a one-of-a-kind stone with a mysterious origin. How long has she been here staring at it? Certain enigmas remain unsolvable, but not for Sandra. She's a gemologist with a scientific mind and a taste for investigation. Sandra has come to the Smithsonian to perform research on the mysteries of the Hope Diamond. We can completely see the gemological studies as investigation. Leticia Gilguerri, gemologist and teacher at L'Ecole School of Jewelry Arts. Because actually we are looking for clues, we are observing and we are analyzing, and all of these uh, characteristics that we will find will uh, allow us to have an idea of what we have in hands to characterize the stones. And then when you have more information about the stones, you can begin to try to understand uh, the story of the stones and everything around, especially when it comes to the history. And the Hope Diamond is quite uh, interesting because it's one of the largest blue diamond. And if you go and ask anyone in the streets, they would probably think that the diamond can only be colorless. So when you talk about one of the largest blue diamond that we know, it's quite uh, unusual. It's something very special. And that's probably something that for scientists will be very interesting to understand why this one, specifically this one, is blue. Of the many mysteries hidden within the Hope Diamond, the question of its origin is the one which captivates Sandra most of all. It is said that diamonds come from the depths of the Earth, but we also know that certain rare diamonds have more interstellar origins, meteorites which have fallen from the sky. And inside this rare diamond, Sandra wonders if it's not a glimpse of the constellations she sees shining inside. We are used to say that the diamonds are the witness of the history of Earth. That's something quite fascinating about that. If you think about time and if you think of the time of the creation of the Earth, you have to think 4.56 billion years. That's quite <laughs> big. But if you think about diamonds, uh, the oldest diamond, the Canadian diamond, they are uh, actually 3.5 billion years. And that's for me something quite fascinating. And to create diamond, it's also quite a long, amazing journey. Actually, to have diamonds, you need carbon. You can think carbon, it's something quite usual. You can find carbon in many things like graphite. But actually, for having uh, diamonds, you need to have a such important pressure and temperature that you can only find uh, these at uh, incredible depth uh, in, inside the Earth. But then you think, okay, we have diamonds inside the Earth, but how can we get them? How can we get them to put on our uh, necklace or a ring? And then you have to think about this uh, amazing, huge volcanic eruption. We call them kimberlitic eruption. And this eruption, they are able to just uh, take the rocks and bring it on the surface. And these eruptions are very, very strong. Sandra gazes upon the Hope Diamond through the glass. She observes and contemplates each scintillating facet. Her stare penetrates the heart of the stone. 
The color of this diamond is in itself an enigma. A luminous blue which transforms from dark to light with each turn. How can we define such a unique shade? How could it be possible for gemologists and jewelers to classify it and determine its monetary value? To describe the color of diamonds, we have a uh, different uh, classification that we can use. Uh, they have been developed by the GIA, the Gemological Institute of America, uh, and for the OPE. They have uh, worked on this uh, description of the color. And actually, they have described the OPE diamond as a fancy deep grayish blue diamond. That means that they have uh, a principal uh, tint, hue of blue, uh, a secondary hue of gray, and then this fancy dip indicates that it's a quite intense uh, color, a little dark but intense. Then to make this work of uh, describing the color of diamond, actually we don't use any scientific tools. We still use the human eye. That's the only way how we can do it. So we will try to be in the more neutral uh, space, a white space with a standard light. Uh, people will wear a white cloth, uh, everything to try to be as neutral as possible. And by comparison with master stones, they will be able to tell the color of a stone. It can be emerald, it can be sapphire, it can be ruby. For each of them, we will try the same way. The only thing is that for diamonds, it would be much more important because it will directly have an impact on the price. Diamonds can be almost all the color of the rainbow. It can be pink, it can be red, violet, purple, uh, blue, orange, green, uh, white, black, brown. The only thing is that uh, we need scientific tools to be able to understand the cause of the color. So, for example, for the blue diamonds, there, there is different uh, possible origins, but for the orb diamond, uh, we know. Uh, what is the cause, thanks to scientists. So uh, actually it is the presence of a very few number of atoms of boron. Boron atoms can have a direct impact on the color of, of diamonds. Uh, but when I say very few, it's like 0.000036% of boron atoms inside diamonds. When we think about of diamonds, we think about purity. We think about this 100% of, of carbon, but actually it's wrong because nature is not always very pure things, creating pure things. So there is some uh, chemical elements that can arrive as impurity inside and they will give the colors. And that's the case for the boron, for the blue color. Sandra heads for the Institute's library. A mystery remains unsolved, a major historical enigma. But where to begin her research? Documentation of the Hope Diamond begins at the Eliasson Boutique in London in 1812, and the voyage continues all the way to the Smithsonian collection. It is passed from the hands of Mr. Hope to an unhappy sultan, to the rich and eccentric Mrs. McLean, and then on to the famous jeweler of the stars, Harry Winston. But what's behind the story of this diamond before it suddenly appeared at the Eliasson Boutique in London? Before 1812, gems with such exceptional weight and color had been found only in India in the 18th century. Sandra knows that today, the Hope is the largest blue diamond in the world. But it once had a rival, even bigger, the French blue. An even more dignified stone that was discovered in India by the famous explorer Jean-Baptiste Tavernier. The French blue was stolen in 1792 and the biggest jewel heist of that century. And then it vanished without a trace. All that remains of this marble is a fantastic replica, which Sandra was able to see in Paris at the School of Jewelry Arts. Could it be that the Hope Diamond and the French Blue share a common ancestry? Sandra wonders and knows she's probably not the only person to have this idea. She simply must know for sure. 
As the light of sunset washes through the library windows, Sandra meticulously researches her new questions. Her investigation is far from complete. The scientific research has something quite fascinating that most of the time it's the result of the convergence of different teams. And in our case, for the Hope Diamonds, of a team, the Smithsonian Institute, and the second one in Paris with the mineralogist uh, François Farge, who was ordering, classifying all the stones in Paris as the curator of the collection. And one day, doing this amazing work of ordering the stones, he found a lead model in the drawers with a paper mentioning the Hope Diamond. The lead model actually is bigger uh, and has a different size than the Hope Diamond. That's the weird stuff about it. Because we know, uh, thanks to, to the literature, that the blue diamond of with the 14s is supposed to be around 69 carats and the Hope Diamond is 45. So it's quite weird about that. And actually, this lead model, according to drawings that we have, it really looks like the blue diamond of Louis XIV. So it might be a lead. And at this moment, you only have one idea. Maybe I've found the proof of the relation between the blue diamond of Louis XIV and the Hope Diamond. So the idea was to work with the team of the Smithsonian Institute and find other elements to confirm. So just cross the Atlantic Ocean with the lead model, uh, arrive at the Smithsonian Institute, and they were able to compare, only visually compare, uh, the lead model and the Hope Diamond. And it was very close, enough close to say, let's go further. So the idea was to make a 3D modelization of the lead model and also of the Hope Diamond to compare uh, and see if maybe it can uh, fit inside the stones. Because in this case, as we see that they didn't have the same shape, the idea is that maybe the stones, the Hope Diamond, was a recut of the previous stones. So when you recut, you lose some weight, you have to change a little the, the form, but you can also keep some facets. So the idea was to compare the, the size, the dimensions of the, of the stones, but also of the shape of the facet and see if it can fit, if it's a match between both. So they have made this 3D modulation, they made the comparison, and then they see that it works. So at that moment, uh, you have elements to say that the orb diamond is probably the descendant, most probably the descendant of the uh, blue diamond of Louis XIV. Sandra has amassed a great deal of information about the Hope Diamond and its history. Night has fallen, and the Smithsonian will be closing soon. Reluctantly, she puts back the book she'd been combing through because she would love to stay longer. She smiles as she reflects upon a description of the Hope Diamond, which she came across in an old Washington Post article. A minuscule fragment of the midnight sky, which fell to earth and still shines with starlight. Voice of Jewels is a podcast from L'Ecole, School of Jewelry Arts, supported by Van Cleef and Arpels, with Leticia Gilguerie, gemologist and teacher at L'Ecole, School of Jewelry Arts, written by Martin Quenillon and Aram Kebachian, performed by Eduardo Ballerini, and produced by Bababam. <laughs>